<laughs> All right. Rod and Brian, you guys directed Amanda Knox, the new Netflix documentary, which gives viewers an in-depth look at a case that really shocked the country. Um, talk about coming together on this. What attracted you guys to this project? Well, in 2011, we saw the way that this story had sort of captivated the world at that point and we wanted to understand um, not only what it was like for these people who were living at the heart of the story um, to be inside of this tragic event that had been turned into this piece of sensational journalism that was you know appealing to people around the world but we wanted to to make a first person account of that so to hear from them directly um, because their voices had largely been missing from sort of that sensationalized coverage that you know, we were seeing everywhere at that point. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in that first person perspective, talking to Amanda, was it difficult to get her to agree to do this? Because uh, yeah. I, I mean, it seems like it's something that she wouldn't want to revisit. It was actually difficult to get everyone to do the film. <laughs> I think that, you know, part of the part of the reason why the film took five years to make, there were kind of a number of reasons, but First and foremost, it was the fact that, you know, uh, Amanda, Raffaele, Giuliana Manini, these, these people had uh, been so thoroughly covered in the news and had been called so many names by the various different kind of factions and sides that, that, that played out, uh, you know, kind of on the fringes of this, of this story, that they were all reticent to participate. And Amanda actually turned down our, our initial kind of uh, requests for an interview and it, it wasn't until about three years later actually that she agreed to do the film and so during that time period we were getting to know everyone and trying to you know figure out how we would get the Italian side to participate and you know for us we didn't really want to make a film unless we had both the, the Knox side and the Italian side the Knox flesh does side and the Italian side um, and then you know the other thing that took so much time was we had to find you know, a lot of new perspectives, things that, that people had not seen before. And so we were able to get access to the Italian Supreme Court um, after about six to, six to nine months of kind of back and forth calling constantly. I remember at one point we got the actual head of the Italian Supreme Court happened to pick up the phone when when our fixer and I <laughs> call and, our, and ourselves called the Italian Supreme Court and he happened to pick up the phone and we quickly got him on the phone with the head of the Florence Court and got the two of them to agree to give us access to the to the case files that had really never been unsealed for the general public. And so in there we found all sorts of things that the public had never seen before from you know the, the full uncut crime scene footage where we found a lot of um, the mistakes in investigation that the DNA experts had pointed out in their uh, testimony in 2011. We found actual footage that Amanda Knox had filmed of Meredith Kircher that even the prosecutor said he had never seen before. Um, so we found a, a lot of things in there. And so the process for us was a little bit like a long, you know, long form investigative journalist. We were not only trying to gain the trust of, of sources that didn't necessarily want to speak, but we were also trying to track down information and pieces of evidence and, and you know, uh, pieces of archival that, that helped illuminate the story further. So it was really a five-year process, not only of, of getting sources uh, to speak, but also of getting sources that have these other components that help make the movie what it is. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting about the movie, I mean, I have very strong uh, memories of the case. I think everybody has very strong memories of the case. And, you know, based upon the coverage that was done in the media, I think a lot of those opinions were, oh, well, she's guilty. What a horrible monster. Going into the movie, I mean, did, did you guys have a perspective, an opinion uh, on the case? Did it change at all? Did it evolve at all? Yeah, I think what we saw was that people around the world had a baked in uh, assessment or judgment of these people you know, based on the way that they were accessing the story, right? So people were looking at all of these individuals through the lens of the narrative that they subscribed to, and they were accessing them, you know, based on the way that they felt about them. And we're seeing that, of course, in the way that people are, you know, talking about our presidential election right now. There's a, you know, a large conversation happening about, you know, what are the expectations of, of female behavior? And then what does that possibly say about a woman? Um, 
you know, if, if she's doing the quote unquote right thing or quote unquote the wrong thing. And, and yet, you know, are those the, the relevant conversations or the important conversations to be had? Um, you know, maybe we should be talking about, you know, a candidate's policies or, or, you know, viability as an elected official and not sort of the chaff or the white noise. So when we started looking into this in 2011, we did see that everybody had an opinion and we wanted to understand why people had the, the such strongly held opinions that they did have and yet um, why people were not kind of taking a look beneath the surface or a look beneath the headlines to sort of understand, you know, the, the elements that were at play and also trying to consider each of these people um, as human beings and not just these characters that they've been turned into. I, I think the other component of that is sort of, you know, in, in comparison to the other quote unquote true crime documentaries or, or television series that have come out over the last couple of years, this story was so well known already. And so from the very beginning, our goal was not to relitigate the case, to make a trial film. Our goal was to kind of dive beyond the guilt or innocence questions. And so for us, it was a matter of, of putting aside those biases and trying to figure out, well, what does this entire story tell us about, you know, all of our kind of interests, what stories were titillated by, what we're interested in in the public sphere, and, and kind of how do all of our internal biases, you know, affect not, not only kind of a guilt or innocence verdict, um, but also, you know, what does it say about us as societies and people? And so that was really the goal going in for us. And I think that the revelatory moment for us was when we kind of realized, oh my goodness, there was this big shift in this moment where all of us, including ourselves, you know, as, as young as young people in that in that era and around 2007, 2008, 2009, it's when social media rises and becomes so prevalent. So, you know, it's funny we're doing this conversation on Google Hangout, right? <laughs> and it's being streamed on YouTube. And, you know, we live now in a society where everything gets um, consumed through these outlets. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting to remember that there was a period of time when the media shifted in the way that it operated. And so, you know, this is the rise of clickbait journalism at this, at this time period. And so, you know, the reason a story like this takes hold is because it fits the model, the new models of journalism so perfectly. Uh, it is everything that you want in a piece of clickbait journalism because it, it, you can write an amazing headline that will get clicks, right? And so, uh, you know, what happens there is things get simplified and it kind of, you know, the complexity of things goes away. And, and so... I think that, you know, that has larger implications than just this case. And that was what we were really interested in kind of exploring thematically. Right. I mean, one of the things that the movie does well is it highlights the fact that there was a sensationalism to this story, uh, part created by the media. And what was really disturbing watching the movie was how that sensationalism uh, kind of drove the investigation in a way, you know, uh, sex crime, right? Uh obviously this must have been some kind of uh, uh, sex act gone wrong. You know, why else would this young girl get murdered? Or, or there was a lot of buried elements to it that uh, just weren't necessarily there in the investigation. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, I think that you're, you're hitting on the point, right, is that the way that the stories were created, the way that the narratives were created to engage people and to get them clicking day after day after day, almost like a piece of serialized entertainment, were separate from the trial itself, right? They were the, you know, they, they were the thing that was added on top, this, this layer of noise or, or chaff that was being, you know, built on top of the, the, the evidence or built on top of the legal proceedings. And, you know, you see at the, at the end of Amanda and Raffaele's first appeals trial, when the conversation um, in the media turns into a, a debate over whether or not we should boycott Italy, um, and, you know, then Italians, you know, coming to conclusions about American justice versus Italian justice, when that is where the conversation gets steered to, instead of um, it being a conversation in our media that people are looking for about, you know, facts or evidence or understanding, you know, that's, that's what's surprising to us. And we're hoping that, you know, again, that people take a look at the example in this film and recognize the ways that this is happening in, you know, so many other stories and so many other facets of our lives. And I think that the, the other component of that is, you know, speaking to kind of the interest in the sex game, I think that what that, what that really reveals is how, how deep the kind of psychological rooting of, of all of our kind of animal 
interests lie, right? That, you know, when, when tragedies like this occur, I think that a lot of the time we look for, you know, as, as Amanda says, we want to know who the bad guy is. We, we want to find the rationalization for something for which there is no acceptable explanation. Um, and I think that especially in this case, you're talking about, you know, the tragic death of an innocent young woman who had really done nothing wrong whatsoever. And it was such a freak incident, a freak crime. Um, and so I think that it's only human nature to try to categorize it and to try to explain it um, and to understand how something like that could have happened within the context of a rational uh, framework. You know, we want, we want to kind of apply that to, to these kind of stories. Um, and I think that, you know, what happened in this case was by the time the, the evidence started coming out, the narrative was already so firmly established that it was really kind of impossible for the outside world to shift the way that they were looking at the story. So even though by the time the first trial occurred, the idea of a sex game, you know, didn't hold as much evidentiary weight, it was so ingrained in, in the kind of uh, popular culture. You know, if you ask anyone, maybe they haven't followed the case closely, but they kind of go, oh, that was the, the two girls involved in the sex crime, right? And so I, I think that, you know, what that really speaks to is kind of our, all of our kind of obsession with the, with the, uh, with these kind of, uh, animalistic instincts and, and kind of wanting to rationalize these terrible acts. Absolutely. And it makes it kind of striking when you watch the film and you see Amanda talking a few years removed from the events and, uh, uh talk about, uh, getting her side of the story a little bit more. I mean, what was that, uh, what was that process like? Yeah, well, I think what Brian was saying was that we approached uh, Amanda in 2011 after she and Raffaele were acquitted. And at the time she decided she didn't want to, to participate. Um, she wanted to, you know, do what she needed to do herself, I think, which was write a book um, and maybe try to understand her her experience in her own way. And, and we also began talking to um, people in Italy at that point too, because we told everyone that we only wanted to make a film if we could hear from, from both sides of the, the courtroom, so to say. Um, and so we spent a great deal of time earning everyone's trust, you know, and one of the things that we've, we've, uh, we, we do wish that we could have included would have been the, the Kircher family. Uh, Meredith Kircher's family has sort of been clear in the way that they, um, uh, are forced to re-examine the story every time somebody asks them for an interview. And, and still we felt it was important to reach out to them directly to try to include them in the film. We sent them a copy of the film before it was, it was released because as much as this is a story about the experience that Amanda Knox and Raffaele Selecito and Giuliano Manini all went through, you know, the, the Kircher family also went through uh, an even more tra tragic experience. And after all these years doesn't have any, in any closure or any way to sort of understand what all these different verdicts, two guilty verdicts, two innocent verdicts say, and, and they probably will never absolutely know what happened to their daughter that night. Um, and so as filmmakers, you know, we're trying to include Amanda Knox um, in the film in the same way that we're trying to include all of these people and all of the different points of view as it relates to the way this story uh, affected them. And the, and the way the interviews kind of happened um, was very much, it was kind of an interesting circumstance of making a, a film about an entire eight year, 10 year decade long process um, and making it at some point simultaneous to the events actually occurring. So when Amanda came back to us after three years and said she had changed her mind and wanted to participate in a documentary, it was right when she was facing a, uh, another verdict at the appellate level in, in Italy. And so I think that, she felt as though it was the right time for her to speak that, that, um, you know, she didn't know what the future was going to hold. And so she wanted to, to do another interview. And the same thing happened for Giuliano Manini when, you know, we spent years trying to get him to do an interview. And the time when we were finally able to get him to sit down was in 2015 after the final verdict. And he had felt as though his side had not been, had not been taken into account with as much weight. And so, you know, that was how the entire film came together. It was a, ma it was a matter for us of balancing, um, you know, all of these different points of view and components and, 
you know, trying to trying to come out with a clear and cogent um, explanation of, of what had happened. And I think that, you know, by by hearing these people and by getting to know them and, and their personalities and their worldviews, it actually gives you a clearer understanding of, of kind of the circumstances around which these this, this incredible, you know, case that was that was followed by millions and millions of people over the world, how it actually went down kind of at the center of the onion. You know, if you peel back all the layers, they're, they're really a, a few key people at the, at the core of it. And was it difficult to remain objective and unbiased? I mean, this being a movie about, in some parts, journalistic objectivity, uh, was it difficult for you guys as filmmakers to leave your own opinions at the door in assembling this well, film and talking to people? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about making a film like this is because it's so divisive, even within our filmmaking team, in the, in the editorial <laughs> room, there, there are differences of opinion on guilt or innocence or all these things. And so what that actually does is it forces you to put those things aside. And it also gives you a check and balance system. So, you know, because every single piece of evidence, because every single point of view and every moment is seen through so many different prisms, through so many different lenses, depending on how you view it, you know, it's important what, what we did was kind of in the process of clearing away the chaff, of really getting to the core of, of how these verdicts had come to be, uh, especially the final Supreme Court verdict. It allowed us to kind of get rid of a lot of the things that, you know, were the quote unquote, you know, depending on which side you, you were on, were the biased pieces of evidence on the other side or the biased moments, right? And so for us, that Supreme Court verdict was really crucial in structuring the film. It allowed us to kind of step back and to not make it about our personal opinion, but to make it about, you know, how the Italian court system had come to their final conclusion. And then to find, you know, the humanity and the kind of larger societal uh, implications uh, that surrounded these events that, that led to that final verdict. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it does. I think Brian and I too were, were both interested in information and, and, and in facts, and there's a lot of lessons to take away from the film that can be applied to, you know, stories that are not just uh, things that happen as a tragic event and then get turned into something else. But, you know, there's, there's a rush to, to judgment and conclusions in the way that we consume stories these days. And people want to, you know, come to a certain determination based on, on how they feel or, you know, based, again, looking at something through the lens of uh, a bias that they already have. And, you know, we worked really hard throughout making the film to, you know, to try to learn as much as we could, again, starting back in 2011, but also through digging through all of the archive that we found, all of the, you know, the, the court documents, all of the testimonies, all of this to try to understand fully what had happened. Um, because I think as individuals, we're interested in, in information and in facts and, you know, and we're hoping too that people consider their role in, you know, establishing narratives that influence the way that others feel about stories like this. And maybe, you know, we should all wait until we have all of the appropriate information to come to those conclusions. Um, and then to have a conversation about the information and not just the emotional reaction to that information. Absolutely. Uh, lastly, I want to ask you guys, we're an awards website and uh, we are in the middle of Oscar season and this is uh, eligible for that. Uh, now, Brian, you're an Emmy nominee for your show, Chef's Table and uh, Rod, you've won awards at various festivals. So I just want to ask you real quick, uh, if this film were to get that kind of recognition from the Academy, what it would mean to you and perhaps what it would mean uh, for people uh, seeking out the film, I mean, for the exposure of the film? Well, I think that, I think that you know, obviously it's a, it would be a great honor, but I think that for us, the thing that's, that's really important is hopefully it would mean that more people would hear the stories of the people in the film. And I think that, you know, really, when you when you go into making a film like this, it's really all about the people that are participating in, in your film and trying to be, you know, good and responsible in telling their story to the world. And so I, th I think that for us, hopefully what that would do is generate a, a larger conversation about some of the issues that we've discussed, you know, kind of the way that we do look at women in society, the way that, you know, women are sexualized or desexualized, the way, you know, the way that we all consume information, the, the kind of path that that media and journalism has taken uh, in the last few years. And, you know, also kind of about, you know, how we all come to, you know, take one side or the other on so many issues. And I think that, you know, hopefully that would, that we could generate a, a larger conversation about that. But at, at its core, I think that, you know, what we're really hoping is that, is that people see the film and, and, 
you know, really their, their minds are expanded about this particular story and they may come away from the film looking at it in a totally different way. Not so much about the innocence or guilt, but that, you know, this, this story that initially seemed sensationalistic and, and as tabloid fodder actually said a lot about kind of the, the way that we all live today. Yeah. I think we're also hoping too that people see all of these individuals as, as human beings again and, and consider their position um, and, and empathize with them regardless of how you, you feel about them, whether or not you think that they're legally right or wrong or whatever that might be. I think, you know, we're all so quick to rush to judgment and to conclusions about the person uh, across from us instead of taking the time to consider who they are and their background and their worldviews and the things that matter to them. And it was, you know, when we showed the film to um, Amanda Knox and Raphael Selecito and Juliana Manini and Nick Pisa, they all, they all responded to the, to the versions of themselves that have been in the film. But Amanda and Juliana Manini both remarked that they learned a little more about the, uh, the person across from them as a human being for the first time. And so we're hoping that people watch the film and have empathy for the human condition and know that we're all flawed and we all have certain judgments and uh, reasons why we come to certain conclusions, but that we're all people at the end of the day who deserve to be heard and to be understood. Ryan, yeah, Ryan I, that, I, I would also, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and also, I think it's also good to point out, you know, how exciting it is to be working in the documentary field at, at a time when so many amazing filmmakers you know, there's so many people, even just within the Netflix family, I saw 13th the other day and I was just blown away by it. And I think that, you know, we exist in this beautiful moment when so many documentaries are, are you know, raising important issues about, about our societies. And I think that, you know, it's so exciting to see those questions be raised, but also to be done in a cinematic way, in a way that attracts big audiences to, the, to, these, to these films. And I think that, you know, that's, that's really the most exciting thing at the end of the day for us. Absolutely. Brian, Rod, thank you both so much. Congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. You're welcome. Have a good day.